Well, good morning, Family Church, and welcome to the end of waiting week. And you're thinking, what do you mean, waiting week? Well, for many of you, this is this weird time between Christmas and all the celebrations of Christmas and you were so excited for and the decorations that were set up and the presents that were wrapped and now all that's left is carnage and the the empty boxes and the garbage bags perhaps filled with whatever remnants of the celebration of Christmas remain and and yet you're also waiting and looking forward to perhaps the new year and all that the new year has to offer. But in that reality, you're in the waiting room, the waiting week. It's this awkward time where you're between hype and hype, between Christmas and New Year's. It's this weird time when you're realizing the reality perhaps of looming debt as a result of celebrations that waits for you. And maybe you find yourself waiting for the new year. For some, you cannot wait to get out of 2023 and are so excited about the opportunities that God has for you in 2024. For others, you're waiting for some family members perhaps to head on home. It's been a great visit. Uh, For others, you're waiting to head on home because it's been a great visit and and all the, the waiting that goes on. And you're waiting for the kids to go back to school. If you're in that phase, you're thinking, man, I love my children and I really love it when they have a little bit of time in a classroom and I get to recoup my life again. And uh, it is an interesting place that we find ourselves. And and we've been walking through this reimagining Christmas picture where we started before Christmas, really looking at what if Christmas isn't about pretty decor, but about the restoration of the mess. And Pastor Jason really pressed into that. And, And then, of course, Christmas Eve, we said, what if Christmas wasn't about coming home, but in fact, leaving home as Jesus, our Savior, did, left the throne of heaven to come and dwell amongst us as a baby and then grow, of course, and uh, fulfill the ministry he was called to. And today, I really want to press in and think about it from the perspective, what if Christmas isn't just about receiving, but actually about giving? And we have a story of some some men who clearly knew what it was or what it meant to wait. And so many are familiar with the story of the Christmas star and the Magi, that, that these men who waited and knew about a star and knew about the history coming toward them, the promised Messiah. And it's clear in our story that they've been waiting a long time but they were very clear that what this star meant. And I I just, before we get into this message today, I think it's important that there's something that happens when we start to look at the Bible and we begin to look at mysterious things. And this star has intrigued me. Many times I've, I've wondered, how did this work? And I've watched videos where science, those who study astrology and science will, will try to find patterns in the stars. And they've actually created programs that rewind the clock and the movements of planets and stars to make sense of this story. And this story, I'm not sure that we can make sense of without just surrendering honestly, fully to what God is capable of. You know, Psalm 19.1 says, the heavens declare the glory of God. The heavens declare. See, God uses the heavens He uses you and me. He uses animals like Balaam's donkey to actually talk and communicate. And if you think from the Bible as things that I can only explain by science, I'm afraid sometimes we lose lose the, the mystery and the majesty of God. And then ironically, the more we worship God through science, the more it reveals his mystery. And so today I want to just lay before you an idea here that this star that we're going to speak of and we're going to look at, and we're going to look at how people responded to this appearing of this star was truly a magnificent uh, thing that God did. And I think we should give it higher value into something special and miraculous and marvelous and a mystery of God, rather than getting lost in the, the weeds, trying to determine how could it have happened? What if we just said, 
wow, God, look at what you did. And so we begin with men waiting for a star, a group who, of worshipers, a group who received great news and were excited to not just receive that news, but to respond by giving as a result. And so we're going to get into Matthew chapter 2. This is a passage that many of you know Pastor Jason walked through, but today's focus is far different, I believe. I think I would like to to walk you through with a bit of awe and wonder. And and I hope that as you're listening and thinking, as you're you're following along, as the, the Holy Spirit speaks to you, that perhaps it will challenge you. And what is your heart of generosity and your heart of worship? And so let's begin in chapter 2, verse 1, and you can follow along with me. Now, after Jesus was born in Bethlehem, uh, excuse me, I'm going to start again. Now, after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod the king, behold, wise men from the east came to Jerusalem, saying, Where is he who was born king of the Jews? For we saw his star when it rose and have come to worship him. When Herod the king heard this, he was troubled, and all Jerusalem with him. And assembling all the chief priests and scribes of the people, he inquired of them where the Christ was to be born. And they told him, In Bethlehem of of Judea, for so it is written by the prophet, and this is the prophet Micah, if you want to make a note. Micah 5, chapter 5, verse 2 through 4 says this, And you, O Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah. For from you shall come a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. Then Herod summoned the wise men secretly and ascertained from them what time the star had appeared. And he sent them to Bethlehem saying, go and search diligently for the child. And when you have found him, bring me word that I too may come and worship him. And I want you to just pause there at the end of verse eight. This is a a scheming deceiver, this King Herod. And we looked at him in more depth a few weeks ago, but I think it's worth uh, recognizing something. It says, he says, tell me what you learn. Come back and tell me so that I can worship him. And if you know the story of Herod, ultimately, that's a lie. His desire was to destroy this child, to destroy him. And so keep that perspective because we're going to look at how King Herod said, I want to worship him but also these magi said, we've come to worship him. And so we'll kind of look through that a little bit more today, but let's continue in verse nine. After listening to the king, they went on their way, these magi, and behold, the star that they had seen when it rose before them until it came to rest over the place where the child was. And when they saw the star, they rejoiced exceedingly with great joy and going into the house, they saw the child with Mary, his mother, and they fell, fell down and worshiped him. Then opening their treasures, they offered him gifts of gold and frankincense and myrrh. And being warned in a dream not to return to Herod, they departed to their own country by another way. Let's take some time and go back through the story. And let's let's look a little deeper today. I've, I've read this story, I don't even know how many times in my life. I'm sure more than 20, 30 perhaps, just in this week alone, at least, at least a dozen in preparation. And I think about how quickly we brush past things when we assume the story. And there's a few things I'm going to kind of burst your bubble for a minute before we get into the story, because many of you have been culturally uh, trained through modern and, and older hymns of Christmas carols. And some of these carols have grossly under, <laughs> underestimated or grossly distorted gospel truth or biblical accuracy. And so um, I'm sorry to break your heart, but if you love the song of We Three Kings, the first thing I'm going to have to dispel is that the Bible doesn't tell us how many of these wise men came. It does not specify. And so this is, comes out of some, some myth and some legend um, when we see three kings or three wise men, but, but the Bible doesn't tell us that. And the second thing, it doesn't tell us their names. Uh, there are lots of speculation about who they could have been, but the Bible does not tell us who they are. And then finally, it does say they're from the east, but it doesn't tell us from how far, but they're certainly a great distance. 
And so as we get into our story, just to kind of to lay the foundation, we want to look at what does the Bible say specifically about them and, and how can we perhaps receive their heart's intentions? The hardest part about a story like this is we don't know all the surrounding details. The Bible gives us enough to, to understand why they came and what their purposes were, um, but it also doesn't give us all the full details of the conversations that it had. So let's, let's dive into this story a little bit and start with the first point I want to draw out today is that these wise men, they came to bring gifts. And the first one was to worship. They came to worship not for wealth. They came to worship not for wealth. You see, they had received good news. They knew of the coming Messiah. They had been waiting for the sign, the star to appear, looking to the heavens, looking to the skies. And when they saw it, it says they responded with worship. Look at what it says in the verse here. It says, after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod the king, behold, wise men from the east came to Jerusalem saying, where is he who was born king of the Jews? For we saw his star when it rose and have come to worship. So the first thing we want to really press into is they came for one purpose. They came to worship. The, the challenge of why I said is not wealth is because they came without an ulterior motive according to the words were given. It says that when they saw the star, when it rose, they said, we've come to worship. This, this is the, the focus. We know the king has come. And they knew that the connection of the star was to the king, the coming Messiah. You see, this, this king, I want you to look closely at what it says. Let's go back and look. It says, where is he who was born king of the Jews? For we saw his star. See, I brushed over that in my reading multiple times. I, I skipped it and in my brain. I think I assumed a word. I think I said, for we saw a star. No, this is very specific. For we saw his star. Well, whose star? The Messiah, the King of the Jews. We, we saw his star. And with that knowledge, when it rose, we have come to worship him. There was no hesitation. There was an awareness. There was an anticipation. They were in the waiting phase for hundreds and hundreds of years. The story passed down that someday this star, his star would arrive, his star. And when they saw it, they couldn't wait. And we're going to spend the, the first part of the coming year really looking at what the heart of worship is. And, and this word worship is really an incredible perspective. It's a desire to kiss the hand of the one who's worthy or a desire to worship the one who's truly worthy, worthy to be called king, king of the Jews in this case, but king of everything, king of all creation, king of you and me. You see, they were not there for wealth. There, there appears there was no personal gain in their benefit to pack up their belongings, to pack up the gifts we're going to discuss in a bit, to, to go great distance of travel through day and night, through hot and cold, through the deserts. There was no gain for them. And they responded because they received good news. And I think it's important that we just pause and keep asking the question, is, is my worship genuine or am I seeking the things of God? I, I'm, I'm afraid that many of us at one time or another, and many we know, really are in pursuit of the gifts of God, the, the wealth, the blessing of God, rather than seeking him for pure worship, to come in relationship with the Father. And so these wise men, they came, and what an incredible moment it must have been for them. And it goes on in our story, and this part I think is so exciting when you look at their response. So first we see they came to worship him, but the second thing I want to point out is the gift that they not only received great joy, but they came with great joy. And it was not a duty. See, they came with great joy, not a duty. And I don't know about how you responded to Christmas as a kid, 
But I was thinking about um, when I was younger, you know, I couldn't sleep. Those nights lasted forever waiting for Christmas morning. And I was about eight years old. And I remember the whole night I could not sleep. I had some, some idea that there was a gift under the tree that I had been begging for. Many of you know the Christmas story, that, that famous movie where the boy gets his BB gun. And of course, you'll shoot your eye out, comes out of mom. And what do you know? <laughs> he shoots and he gets himself in the glasses. And there's this moment as a kid, though, I couldn't wait for my moment. And I didn't know the Christmas story when I was a little boy, but I know my Christmas story. And I was pretty sure there was a BB gun. And that whole night, I could not sleep. See, my parents would often hide the gifts until uh, the evening, and then they would bring the gifts out. And then when you wake up, you would see, and man, I didn't sleep a wink. I was so excited to go out and see what was there. And sure enough, I woke up in the morning, got up, raced up, woke up mom and dad, and there it was. I could see it. I know the shape of a box of a BB gun. I knew it was there. And there was so much enthusiasm. And of course, like good parents, that was the last box that I got to open. Ah, man, my anticipation, I couldn't wait. And I opened it up and we had a a basement style home with a garage in the basement. And my dad set up a little target range there. And I probably shot 10,000 rounds and I don't know for how many days in a row. And I still have that BB gun today. I actually fixed it up to make it work again because the seals were blown out and That was an exciting time. But look at what it says here of how these wise men responded. I I think as it's written, there's a lot to be said in how they received this star. Look what it says. It says, after listening to the king, they went on their way. Now remember, they they first went and saw King Herod and he wanted to abuse them and use them. But they kind of, I like how it says, after they listened to him, like, yeah, whatever king, they went on their way. And behold, Look what it says. The star that they had seen when it rose went before them until it came to rest over the place where the child was. Before we get to the the underlying piece, the focus of this joy aspect, can you just marvel with me for a moment? And behold, the star that they had seen when it rose went before them until it came to rest over a place where the child was. I, you've probably looked at a lot of stars, and you and I, maybe we've seen a comet. Now, comets don't generally move very fast, and maybe we've seen falling stars, which move really quick, but I have yet to see a star that moves in such a way that it says that it goes before me and then stops directly over something in such a way that I can clearly identify that's what it's pointing to. You see, stars in the distance, when I look at them, there's a lot of acreage underneath that star. But it says this one rested over the place where Jesus was. I think we should marvel at that for a moment. And perhaps we need to give God a little more glory here. Perhaps we need to wonder more about the majesty of God and the power of God, that he did something unique here that we can't necessarily just prove with astrology. In fact, we might miss the the mystery and lose out on the power of God when we try to make sense of how could it have worked. And I'm going to just put out there, I think this star was very unique. I don't think this was like anything anyone had ever seen. And I believe that when it says, when they rose and it went before them and came and rested over this place, that there was a clear something unique about this star. It wasn't a planet or a comet. It was clearly something that God did that we can't describe. We can't even imagine, and we can't use science to prove, but we can prove that what God did was took his story, his plan, and put it into action with these wise men. And look what it says on verse 10. When they saw the star, they rejoiced exceedingly with great joy. (laughs) <laughs> this is like four phrases of intensity. This is way more than my BB gun experience. Like I was excited, but these guys, it says they rejoiced exceedingly with great joy. So let's just break that apart. What did they do? First, they rejoiced. This is a high degree of celebration. 
not your normal, yay, high five. This is way out of the bounds. This is a rejoicing. And often when we rejoice, you and me, we end up vocally celebrating. It comes out of us. We can't help it. Secondly, it says they rejoiced, not just rejoiced, but exceedingly beyond what is usual. This is like mega, gigantic, huge praise of rejoicing. What did it look like for these guys when they they walk out and they see the star and then the star begins to move? What was that like? It says, then it says, they rejoiced exceedingly with great joy. Great, this huge amount of joy. And finally, joy. I love this definition It says joy, the lasting emotion that comes from the choice to trust that God will fulfill his promise. See, my BB gun experience was happiness. It was was wonderful. And I still have that BB gun, which is great, but that wasn't joy. What they're talking about here is they celebrated with incredible amounts of joy exceedingly beyond the way we would normally rejoice over something, with mega amounts of great joy, a joy that is a lasting emotion that comes from this choice to trust that God will fulfill his promise. The promise that they were waiting for in the star was being fulfilled. God promised the Messiah would come, and they knew they were going to see the king the Messiah, the Savior who came and left heaven to dwell in bodily form of all things as an infant who would grow to a man. And ultimately, as we looked at a few weeks ago, who would then go to a cross and who would suffer and die on our benefit so that we could receive life in him and in return, give him praise. What if Christmas is not just about receiving, but truly about giving, to giving worship, to giving joy, to rejoice exceedingly each day, even in the midst of hardship and suffering, to rejoice exceedingly with great joy, with an understanding that God has not done and he will fulfill what he promised. The day is coming. The Lord will return. And so as you think about this for a moment, as you think about the middle of this week, you're, you're nearing the end of this incredibly weird in-between week where you are stuck in the waiting room. Perhaps today you're excited because you don't have to wait anymore. You're here to worship. You're here to praise. And I like to encourage that you evaluate, is your joy genuine or do you find worshiping a duty? These guys, I don't don't see it as a duty. I don't think rejoicing exceeding with great joy has any any piece or part of duty. This is a joy. It naturally flows out of them. But all too often, I think we perhaps come to wherever we go to worship as a sense of duty, as checking off a list. We we perhaps enter into a prayer over a meal or something as, as an obligation rather than an exceedingly great joy of praise. Or we attend a service, much like you're doing right now, and, and we come begrudgingly, perhaps, or frustrated, rather than rejoicing exceedingly with great joy that we get to gather and praise his name. The last thing that I want to press into today is what I think is such a beautiful picture and kind of the culmination of the whole journey the Magi came through. And they brought gifts, and they brought gifts to bless, not as bribes. I know the text doesn't go into great surrounding story of, did they benefit from this or was that their motivation? I tend to think that it's pretty clear that their heart was pure in this worship and they came to bless Jesus. They chose to worship by giving gifts. And look what it says. It says, then opening their treasures, they offered him gifts. Imagine as they entered into the home, here is the, the, the young Jesus, this, this infant phase. We read through that Herod wanted all the babies killed two years and younger, so the chances are very good here. This child is 
under the age of two. That's what I think is the best way to look at this. They're not at the manger, but they're there. And there's the child. And it says their response is that they opened their treasures to him and they offered him gifts. Notice, first of all, two things. Why are these blessings and not bribes? First, they offered. This is an offering. This is a surrender of a possession, their treasures. Now, it doesn't say if they collected them from lots of people in the community, but their treasures tells me these were their personal possessions. And they came to offer them to the king. And then secondly, it says they offered him gifts. They offered Jesus gifts. Now, the the beauty of gifts is that these are no strings attached free. No bribes attached, no ulterior motive. Boy, if I give you these gifts, King Jesus, will you remember me when you grow up and then take your throne? I think that this was a genuine gift. Just like you and I, we we get to receive a gift of life in Christ. It says this was a free gift to you in Ephesians, it tells us. A free gift. So, So no one can boast and say, look at the gifts I gave to Jesus and he gave me this. Or look at the work I did for Jesus and look what he gave me. He says that it's free. It's free. By faith alone, that's all that's required. And you and I get to receive the gift. And these magi, they presented gifts. They offered these gifts. And oftentimes we look intently at the type of gifts. But today I just wanted to press in for a moment and just ask the question, how how do you do it offering gifts to the king? Do you sometimes come before God and say, boy, I, I hope that this will happen as I give? Do you perhaps sometimes begrudgingly give or try to manipulate God in giving? whether it's your time, your talents, your treasures, whatever that is, or, or is it a genuine way to bless? Because you are rejoicing exceedingly with great joy. I think God's word declares he desires us to be cheerful givers, to offer ourselves fully to him, to offer our resources, which ultimately are his in the first place. And, but look at the three gifts that these kings bring, they, or these, these magi or kings says they gave him gold, frankincense, and myrrh. These gifts have significant imagery attached. First, gold. This is the sign of royalty, of kingship. So they present him with gold. And now, I don't know about you, but if I had a gold bar or multiple gold bars, it doesn't matter if I cut a chunk off of the gold bar or take a flake off of it. I'm looking at it going, wow, this is valuable. But the imagery was that for royalty, for a king. And the, the second one, frankincense. This, this is a, 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 an imagery of deity, of the God-man, of, of Christ who came from heaven, the Messiah, the living God, creator of all things, who sought fit to leave the perfection of heaven, and as we discussed a few weeks ago, into the mess of humanity. Frankincense, a sign of deity. And third, myrrh, this very beautiful fragrance that was a picture of his humanity. And there was two pictures that are important. One, that of uh, the fragrance from the cradle, the the beauty of the odor that you could bring, the the fragrance of of perfume. Also good for healing wounds and and taking care of things. But this, this beautiful opportunity of this young child who was born in a manger, who is growing up now, presented with myrrh, but the tragedy is it also comes back to the king at the cross. And myrrh was a main ingredient as they would wrap Jesus and place him in the tomb after the cross. So a beautiful fragrance that led to the embalming mixture, the the fragrance wrapped around the body as he was taken from the cross and put in the tomb. And I think it's critical that we not lose sight that these gifts were precious and these gifts were theirs to give. And they were offering these gifts as a blessing, not a bribe. In fact, it says 
on verse 12, and being warned in a dream not to return to Herod, they departed to their own country by another way. In fact, for me, that says they didn't want anything to do with Herod. They, they perhaps could have benefited greatly. Bribes could have been given. And they said, no, we want to worship. And so they bring these three incredible gifts to point to the Messiah, the one who would come to fulfill the promise, the king who would come. And so Jesus, he came to give, came to give himself fully. The Magi, they came to worship and to give gifts, the gift of worship as well. And you and I, we are called to come and to surrender and wait for the glorious day when Christ will come again. I love you guys, and I hope that as you think about going into the next year, you'll spend some time to reflect on the goodness of God and, and just anticipate that God wants to be a part of your life. And so I'm going to release you to the campuses. I love you guys. Look forward to seeing you in the new year. Yeah, as you sit here with me and you're watching, I, I hope that there's kind of two things I want to kind of press into for a few minutes. First one is this. As we end a year, sometimes the, the year ends and it's been a miserable year. I know that many of you perhaps are watching. You've been suffering this year and some of you have suffered through the loss of family members. And some have suffered through the continual pain of, of illness or something that's, that's keeping you from being at your full potential. And some have lost jobs and some have lost relationships. But in the middle of all the suffering, where can you give God thanks? If you're watching this today and you have life in Christ, I pray that you would reflect on that, that you would say, thank you, God, even though in the midst of that, I can still rejoice exceedingly with great joy at the hope that you've given me. And, and, I, and I just encourage you, just look back. Where was God? Give him praise when he showed up in the places where you thought you were hopeless and you were reminded of great hope. And, and then secondly, I just want to encourage you, 2024 is ahead. And I'll tell you, it's been an interesting last couple of years. And I think 2024 has already several challenges ahead of us as a globe, but also incredible opportunity for God to reveal himself more fully to you. So I just encourage you to pray for guidance in the year to come. Let's just close. Can I just pray with you? And would you just join me as we lift up our, our thanks to God? Let's pray. Father God, we thank you. You are a God of wonders, a God of majesty, of power and might, and you have a plan for each one of us right now who are listening. And God, I pray that if there's anyone here that does not have life in Christ, that they would begin their new year surrendering their lives to you, that they would say, Jesus, be my Lord and Savior. Jesus, come into my life and transform my mess. Jesus, I invite you fully into who I am and who I think I'm supposed to be. And I give you full permission to transform that image into your likeness. God, give us strength in this new year. Give us vision for where you want each of us to be led and give us people in our communities where we live, work, and play that we can declare the gospel and help them to find life in Christ. We thank you for a year that's passed and we celebrate a year ahead. It's in your name we pray. Amen.